I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Mark Baumgartner, the Chief Investment Officer of the Institute for Advanced Study, where he oversees a billion-dollar portfolio that seeks to achieve just median returns, but with significantly less risk. Prior to joining IAS, Mark had stints at the Forge Foundation overseeing risk, at Morgan Stanley's Alternative Investment Partners, at both quantitative and qualitative hedge funds, and as a management consultant. Oh, and uh, he studied to be a rocket scientist before that. Our conversation covers Mark's path to IAS and the principles of luck, risk, and uncertainty on that path. We discuss the IAS portfolio, one that's catered to achieve a low-risk profile, and how he's stayed the course when that structure hasn't been rewarded by markets. We talk about identifying managers that fit into his approach and different metrics of defining risk at both the manager and portfolio levels. Please enjoy my conversation with Mark Baumgartner. Mark, thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. We always start talking about people's backgrounds. So (laughs) why don't you just walk through kind of how you got to the CIO seat? It's a strange path, that's for sure. I grew up in Florida and watched a lot of rocket launches and always felt close to uh, Cape Canaveral and the space shuttle. I I remember drawing pictures of the space shuttle when I was 13, 14 years old. I actually saw the first launch. Really neat experience. So always had that desire. And so I pursued that in school. I studied aerospace engineering in undergrad. And then when I got out of undergraduate in 1991, the country was in recession. And uh, I said, well, you know, why don't I just go for some more schooling? and pursued graduate studies. The theme in my life has been luck. I think it was lucky that there was a recession in 1991 to push me to go get some more schooling. I went to Princeton for graduate school. And at Princeton, it was a very, very different experience than undergrad. I did undergrad at University of Florida. And I always like, and I said, when I was at Florida, I had a calculator in my hand and I was always solving problems. At Princeton, I threw the calculator out and exchanged it for a piece of chalk. And we did a lot of theory there. And the other thing that Princeton had was it had a school of political science. And I had a great advisor there who encouraged me to branch out. And so I took classes in the poli sci department there, got a minor in public policy. And that shifted me off of engineering and aerospace to public policy and application of quantitative methods to areas that were more qualitative, more sociology, psychology oriented. And folks in qualitative disciplines are faced with no less uncertainty than folks in engineering disciplines, perhaps some more uncertainty. And so that's where I found my home. It was a departure from engineering, but I enjoy that blend of addressing uncertainty quantitatively and qualitatively. And so what was the first step after you left academia? So it was into management consulting. Yeah, I was fortunate to find someone who's actually been a mentor to me my whole career, Hamilton Helmer. So Hamilton was a a Bain consultant. He actually worked with Bill Bain in the early days. And I had moved out to the West Coast to start his practice there in Silicon Valley doing strategy work for firms on the West Coast. And he saw some kind of potential in me and hired a kid. I always joke, I said, when Hamilton hired me, I didn't know the difference between revenue and profits, just money. But Hamilton saw some raw potential there and brought me out to join his strategy firm. And I learned about business and strategy with Bain level partner working close with them. Incredibly, again, luck, incredibly fortunate. And how long did you stay? I was there for three years. And we had fantastic casework. This was Silicon Valley in the late 90s. So just amazing, right? If I knew then what I know now, I probably should have stayed there and should have been 
involved somehow in the venture industry there. It was so much fun. So what do you know now that you didn't then? How to create companies and all of the value creation potential that exists in that area and how it's done, right? I was a kid yeah. uh, 20 years ago now. But I enjoyed consulting a lot. And I said, this has been so great here. Why don't I take a look at one of the branded shops? And I ended up going to BCG three years later and spent four years there being a generalist and just looking at all sorts of different industries, airlines, healthcare, energy, just a lot of fun. Consulting was wonderful. And along the way, I started to learn a little bit more about investing and seeing how value creation was rewarded by the markets. And I ended up after four years going back to join Hamilton at his firm, Strategy Capital. This was in the early 2000s. We had a long, short equity hedge fund. The memory for me is being in the boardroom at Netflix before Netflix was Netflix. It was really so early. They had a red envelope company. And having that experience and seeing that company being built from the inside and being able to interact with management was eye-opening for me. What was it like in those years sitting inside a hedge fund? Very, very different. It didn't feel institutionalized at that point. It felt like there wasn't even a hedge fund. It was just an investment firm. And we were doing what we did as strategy consultants, which was to look at industries and look at companies and pick winners and pick losers. It was pretty clear to us that at some point, Netflix was going to, if not kill Blockbuster, seriously hurt Blockbuster. So right there, you see a, a nice pair trade. And you know, it wasn't clear at that point. It was Amazon had not even entered the business yet, was sort of threatening to enter. If I don't know if you remember, they actually had a DVD delivery system before they were streaming. And it was Reed Hastings who had the vision to stream content, which you could see things converging and it's reality today. But back in 2003, you know, it was pretty tough to see where broadband had to go. And obviously mobile devices have changed all that as well. It was not as institutionalized. We were just picking winners and losers. And how long did you say? So that was a year. Okay. And the story there is we had a market neutral fund that had equity like volatility. And so no one was really ready for the downs that came along with some of the ups. So we shut that down and I went to work at another hedge fund called Quantal, a um, quantitative market neutral fund, which one of the other partners at, at Strategy Capital was also the chairman of that and brought me over to be a PM and, and help them grow that business. Very, very different strategy than strategy capital was fundamental equity and Quantal was stat arb. I really got my risk degree there. Quantal was first and foremost a risk management firm. So it was sort of a better bar. It was headed by the former head of finance at Stanford, Paul Flutter and Terry Marsh, who was the former head of finance at Berkeley. Great DNA there, great finance knowledge there. And so that was the risk model. And then the hedge fund was built around that, which was really interesting. That was, for me, that fit, right? This idea of uncertainty management, which I had through my studies of turbulence in my PhD program, and then business uncertainty and management through management consulting experience, and now hedge funds. And so it's always been about managing those uncertainties. And the Stat Arb shop, Quantal, gave me some more insight into how portfolios could be managed in a very risk, risk controlled way, right? That's what you want to do. You want to take risk. You don't want to avoid risk. Howard Marks, a risk avoidance strategy is a return avoidance strategy, but you want to manage those risks. So that's been key for me in my learning about hedge funds and then how I manage hedge fund portfolios after. So you have a setup where you've got two leading finance profs in the early years of quantitative hedge fund investing, but we don't really know about Quantal today. Yeah. So yeah. what happened? Quantal is about the same as they were. Call it about a $500 million hedge fund. Not small, not large, but to grow, you need to change. And so we were already turning that portfolio over about seven times a year. It happened to be a 
higher frequency trading. Back then it was high frequency. Today it's not very high frequency. But we noticed that as we grew, we had more slippage in the portfolio. We we're impacting markets. And so alpha was decreasing. And so the happy medium was they had kind of maxed out their size. I think there are a lot of funds like that. And you can make that trade off as a fund. Sometimes can I grow and still give the returns that I've had in the past? Or So what was the next step after there? So the next step was Morgan Stanley. I was fortunate again, in the spirit of luck, to find someone who actually understood my background, Jack Coates, who was the CIO at Morgan Stanley's uh, Alternative Investment Partners Group in West Conchoc. Jack was the CIO at Warehouser and had come over with that lift out to Morgan Stanley. And he had an aerospace engineering background, believe it or not. And so I came to join him and help him build that business. It was the early stages of the OCIO expansion. And so we were looking to help institutional clients do what Jack had done at Warehouser, which was incredible. Jack started at the Warehouser Pension Fund in 1985, the same year that Dave Swenson started at Yale. Two totally, totally different strategies, though. Warehouser was a synthetic 60-40 portfolio using derivatives, right, in a pension plan, mind you, in 1985. So a synthetic exposure plus alpha from hedge funds and all sorts of inefficiencies that exist in the financial markets back in the day. And it was highly risk controlled and, and risk managed, quantitative, what you might think of an aerospace engineer putting in place at a pension plan in 1985. And fast forward 20 years, that portfolio, which was levered two to one and used alternative investments, which in the 80s and 90s were something inconceivably risky to most, that portfolio outperformed Yale on a, an absolute and a risk adjusted basis. But yet Jack was very in the background, you know, Jack was not recognized and sort of unconventional, but almost too unconventional, a cowboy taking risk and sure succeeding, but that's the problem with being different in the world. The worst thing is to be different and fail. The next worst thing is to be different and succeed because then you are a cowboy or you're a risk taker or you're just lucky. But that's, you know, a story of how you can be different. And that portfolio weathered the crash in 87. It, it weathered the Mexican peso crisis. It weathered long-term capital management, weathered the dot-com boom and bust. But it's not widely adopted. There are a few foundations out there that have that type of portfolio. Talk a little more about what that portfolio was and why it provided the ballast that it did. It was just a collection of risks, but it was very, very different. So I think the origin of that portfolio was Jack said, why would we want a 70-30 or a 60-40 equity fixed income mix? Because we're not going to get the type of returns that we could from having you know, hedge funds or having other types of alternative investments in the portfolio. We don't need to take systematic risk. We're getting paid for it, but we're not getting paid as much as we could for idiosyncratic risk. And so they did that for a couple of years and the board, I think at Warehouser kind of gulped, but they said, well, you know, Jack is really smart. Let's just go ahead with it. So fast forward a couple of years and possibly through the 87 crisis, I'm not sure, but the performance of that portfolio, as you can imagine, very, very different than performance of a 60-40. What did that portfolio look like? Call it a collection of alpha generating managers, a portfolio largely uncorrelated with the market, hedge funds, macro, relative value, things without a lot of embedded market beta, and derivative overlay, um, which was managed to get the betas. To get the beta. And to recognize that there are embedded betas in hedge funds. I would not call this easy or clean. Jack had a uh, sign on his wall at Morgan Stanley. It said, don't try this at home. <laughs> because you need to pay attention to it. Obviously, everything is risky. A knife is a risky thing to hold in your hand, but you want a surgeon to use that to do good. So that's what we would describe the strategy as. It's risky, but if you manage the risk, just like most of our hedge fund managers, 
are risk takers, but they're managing that risk. And that is sort of the key there. So it was highly risk managed derivatives overlay with alpha. Attention. And is that really what he brought over to Morgan Stanley as well? Yeah. And by the way, look, portable alpha is a bad word now, but that's what it was. I mean, that's what we were talking about doing. We wrote white papers on this novel idea and that's what it is. But I think portable alpha in 2006, which is when I joined Morgan Stanley, that was before the crisis. And there were a lot of people that were recognizing the potential of this. And obviously, quote unquote, it's just leverage, right? So yes, it's leverage, but it's applied in a very intelligent and highly risk managed way, right? To achieve a, an objective. That's how you do it. A lot of people took that and just, ah, we're going to lever up. And that ended badly. How long did you say Morgan Stanley? Two years. And what was the impetus for moving on? Well, the crisis happened. Yeah. Morgan Stanley shrunk uh, lots of businesses. So we were one of the casualties of that. And again, you think that, well, that sounds pretty unlucky or no, I choose to believe it was luck because I was fortunate enough to find the Ford Foundation at that point. There was a leadership transition at Ford and a desire to perhaps change the strategy there, which was heavily equity centric. And Ford was very early in private equity and venture and had a terrific portfolio, but suffered a bit during the crisis. So the Ford's portfolio was very equity centric, mm -hmm. suffered in the crisis. And that was an impetus to change or to hold well, on? Well, Ford, to their credit, held on and still tell stories again about how tough it was in March of 09, just staring down into this abyss and no one had any idea. And it was much, much worse than anyone had expected. And there was a lot of confusion as to whether things were broken or survivable, right? And Lehman had happened, Bear had happened. The courage to hang tough and keep risk on in that situation was very, very hard. But they did it, which is remarkable, and credit to the board and credit to the investment team there at Ford. And then what we did over the next five years was to shift that portfolio more toward an endowment-like portfolio. We built out the investment team there. We shifted probably eight of the $10 billion at that point into different strategies or different managers. It was an unbelievable transition, fund transition. That shift going into the crisis, you mentioned equity centric. And in fact, the endowment portfolios are heavily equity centric. So what was that well, strategy shift? Before the crisis, it was much more single asset class focused. So public equities, private equity, venture, and fixed income. It almost was a 70. There was very little hedge funds. There was very little energy and natural resources, very little real estate. Yes, there are embedded equity betas in all of those strategies, but there are other ways to search for alpha and see great managers in all of those asset classes. And so that's, that's what we did. And what seat were you in at Ford? At Ford, I was the head of risk and asset allocation, asset allocation and risk. So it was Larry Siegel's old position repurposed for a quant guy. You know, no <laughs> one wanted to say strategy. My risk team at Ford was bigger than my current team at the Institute. Because, you know, it's a larger place. And what was the impetus to moving to the Institute? Well, the Institute is an amazing place. Much, much smaller portfolio. So a lot of people question, well, you're moving to something that's 10 or 15 times smaller. Why would you do that? And I describe it as a small place with a very big board and a great history and mission and alignment with the way that I think about risk and portfolios. And so at the time, Jim Simons was the head of the investment committee. And Marty Leibowitz was on the board. You've had these varied experiences going in. And you show up and you now have a mandate at the Institute to be the chief investment officer. What did you come to believe about investing that led you to take the portfolio where you took it? One of the things that I did at the Institute was to update the investment policy statement with a governance hat on. And so the beliefs actually didn't change, Ted. It's just a reapplication toward a different objective. So do you believe that risk is rewarded with return over time? Sure. 
do you believe that risk means a variance in outcomes? It actually is uncertain. Yes. So we're actually seeking uncertainty. And we are seeking uncertainty in different areas, so diversification. But uncertainty is risk. And so that's really, we're hunting for a lot of risk. There's a lot of different risks in the Institute's portfolio. Combined, they actually result in something that is much lower risk than I think what a lot of our our peers have by design, by mandate. When I joined, I said, Jim, what's the objective for this portfolio? What are you trying to achieve? And Jim said, uh, we want to keep up with our peers. We compete for talent with top universities, and we want to pay our professors and attract talent here. Right? That's sort of the key, this knowledge base. But if you can just keep up with the median peer, that'd be great. And then I kind of I looked around, and I said, so you're asking me to be average? And he said, no. We want you to be median peer return, but with half the risk. <laughs> so you have half the risk budget. Yeah. So that was the key. I said, okay, I understand now. And so that mandate has resulted in a very different strategy for the Institute than most other places. It's just when you have your risk budget torn in half, you can't have the illiquidity in the portfolio and you can't have the volatility and you certainly don't want the drawdown given the spend rate that we have and what higher education price index inflation is, we've got to target an 8% perhaps higher return just to keep our head above water. But yet we can't afford to have more than a 15% or 20% drawdown because we'll never recover. Our spend rate would be too much. Well, I'm presuming Jim didn't open up Renaissance Medallion for you to solve that problem. So how did you go about the strategy? So- the strategy by and large was in place and it was 100% alternatives. That portfolio was in place, that strategy. It was 80% hedge funds and 20% private markets funds, mostly venture. And so the changes that we've made have been much more around the margin of the types of managers that we were seeking and the illiquidity profile of the fund. We've decided that we can afford to have more illiquidity in the portfolio, so we've slowly pushed that allocation out toward 25, 30, and maybe even 35% in private markets with a very high focus on managing those cash flows and liquidity. At the same time, the hedge fund side, people say, how can you even get close to 8% there? Well, we are targeting very high potential return hedge funds, high risk hedge funds. We're not looking for 3% fixed income substitute. We're looking for even more than equities and even less equity beta and even more diversification. So we're searching far afield for great risk takers and great risk managers. And we believe if you find great risk takers and great risk managers, the returns will follow long term. If you take that down to the manager level, what are those types of managers? So without equity beta, are you talking about levered managers or Absolutely. trading oriented? Yeah. Or? So concentration, leverage, and illiquidity right, are the three main risks in any of these portfolios. And then you can argue about whether long or short matters. right? If you have a concentration in a risk factor – that's dangerous. And so leverage just amplifies or de-amplifies the characteristics of the portfolio. And then illiquidity obviously has its own issues in terms of risk. So managing those three types of risks are important. So the, the characteristics of the managers are folks who are great at something, have an edge, have the ability to really take risk and really pursue high returns, but have a strategy for really managing and overseeing that risk, right? So they don't get into trouble. There's no squeeze potential on them. They're able to stay funded and financed through very adverse situations. And really, we are taking a very, very long-term perspective, which I think you have to do. The last five years is is really perfect evidence for this. It's amazing what has happened since January of 2014. I've almost been at the Institute for five years. And my views on where the market 
was headed and where it was going haven't changed at all. What has changed is the outcome five years hence. So back in 2013, 2014, you've got bears projecting low returns. I first heard the term low return environment in 2010. The exact opposite has happened. And if you go back, sorry, to 2013 again, and you look at the forecast, you've got some folks who are on the lower end, but you've got folks like Goldman and JP Morgan and the folks who publish capital market expectations. And you see yeah, equities, 7% annualized return, 15% vol. No surprise there. Really, there's no surprise. This is what people believe, and that's what they believed five years ago. Now you fast forward five years and you look at what has actually happened. Double the returns and two thirds to a half of the vol. And so what is that outcome? Is that a, yeah, that's a better than average outcome or is that a phenomenal outcome? Is that incredible? Is that a one in five year outcome or is that a one in 20 year outcome? I don't know the answer to that. I'm leaning more toward the one in 20 type of year outcome because volatility has been so low and it's been sustained in a very dampened state and returns have been off the charts. I don't think anybody expected earnings on the S&P to be above 150 bucks a share at this point, but buybacks and it's just been a fantastic environment, a fantastic outcome, but no one saw it. That is the thing that I have to keep coming back. No one expected this outcome. And so we're in this very dangerous spot now where managers have five years of track record and they're awful. Great managers, really fantastic brand name, terrific, best investor in the world types of managers have eh, okay outcomes in the last five years, certainly relative to the market. And I'm hearing what I have heard in the past that's very dangerous, which is, well, it's a long term five years is a long time. And yes, I agree. Five years is a long time, but we have had a very, very unusual set of circumstances that have gotten us this track record. So I would be very careful about extrapolating that. I would be very careful about judging what you've just seen in the last five years. So We'll go full circle to where we started, engineering and aerospace and uncertainty management, quantitative. One of the things we do and did in turbulence studies is to normalize results. So you non-dimensionalize things to make them easier to see patterns. And so we apply those types of techniques. And I think everyone should try to apply those types of techniques. Our business is forecasting the future. We want to invest with people who are going to have a certain likelihood of outcomes in the future. If you want to use a track record, especially a track record in the last five years to analyze anything, you better correct it for the environment. How do you go about doing that? Art and science, right? So looking at exposures, looking at risks, listening to the manager, looking at where returns have come from, and then normalizing those results for the past five years and projecting them forward. Where do you expect vol to go? Where do you expect systematic exposures? And by systematic exposure, I mean not just equities and fixed income spreads and things like that, but some of these alternative risk premia, looking at those types of embedded risks, there's no easy answer to predicting the future. So you've had this portfolio that's call it 80% hedge funds, 20% private equity, moving to 65, 35 or something like that. It's got to be a really tough environment these last five years to do that objective of keeping up with your peers who have a lot more equity beta. Yes. What is that pressure like? Yeah, it's tough. When we compare ourselves with peers, we've actually been able to keep up with the median, but we have not kept up with the IVs, for instance. And the IVs are the yardstick that I think everyone uses. And so you've got to just make those corrections. And so we often show our board performance of the institute portfolio as a function of market returns and where expectations have been. This is not a bear market portfolio that we have. It's very, very alpha focused. And admittedly, alpha has not delivered what we've expected it to deliver over the past five years. I hear a lot of 
attacks on alpha and alpha is disappearing. And alpha is just created by the environment. It's a function of people taking risk relative to a benchmark. So I am not too worried about alpha not existing in the future. What I'm worried about is alpha becoming more inefficient and more risky and lower risk adjusted return per unit of alpha going forward. I do think that edge goes away and people figure things out and money piles into strategies. And when capital flows in anywhere, it wrecks not just future returns, but the risks go up as well. So getting dinged twice, you're getting a lower expected return and you're getting a higher expected risk. I think much of the focus is always on that former there. You've talked about uncertainty and you've had five years. It's probably longer. It's probably eight years where that core part of your portfolio hasn't delivered your expectations. At what point in time do you sit back and say, well, it's still uncertain. We still think these principles are fantastic at what they do, but maybe we're wrong. You always have that doubt, right? And so the way you combat that is you go back to first principles. In engineering, it's the law of conservation mass, law of conservation of of momentum and law of conservation of energy. That's it. So if you don't believe those, then you can't believe what comes after that. So what are those first principles you're deploying? So the first principles are, are there inefficiencies in the market? Yes, we believe there are, and we believe there are reasons why they exist. Can those inefficiencies be exploited by folks with relationships, folks with differentiated knowledge, folks with differentiated access, folks that are making use of structural inefficiencies, folks that make money from the lack of attention or care being paid by larger groups, kind of the remoras of the world, all of the folks who are great at using tools and information in new and different ways. All of those things create the ability to take risk and profit differentially from risk. So yes, we believe all those. And if we look back at the past five years or eight years, we've actually done better. We've had median returns. Some people say, well, that's just junk. No, we've done it with so much less risk. Yeah. We've achieved it with the maximum drawdown in the portfolio has been 2%. That's non-existent risk. This is what I want to caution about is, we think you know, anyone's complaining about an 8% return of the last five years with a 2% max drawdown, that won't be achieved again, right? That's phenomenal outperformance from a risk-adjusted basis, yeah. but obviously we have our target return. So I just caution, caution, caution. What happens is if you believe that the risk environment that we've had in the last five years is going to be the same as the risk environment in the next five years, by all means, lever up, concentrate, go for it, get really illiquid. <laughs> you know, it's sure. If you think that the environment in the next five years is not going to be similar and you think it's going to do something else, then you probably need to position differently. If you don't know where the world is headed, then don't position your portfolio like you do. And so... That's what we try to do at Ford in our pursuing a more diversified strategy, more geographically diversified, more strategically diversified. Same thing at the Institute. The Institute has even more diversification. I've heard this, right? Especially in, you know, an equity market that's compounded at 15% in the last five years. Well, you know, we missed the boat on private equity. Yes, but if you go back five years and you did not think that was going to happen. And so you always have to just look, what do you expect? That's one of the other first principles is don't look at the past. I mean, use the past to the extent that you can, but use it in an intelligent way. Extrapolation is bad. Learning from the past and doing a course correction based on the past, I think is much more useful. A lot of people are sort of one way or the other. Well, if you have this back test, back tests are junk. Other people say, we need this back test to be able to invest. What does a back test tell you? There are terrible back tests that are just statistically ridiculous. Other back tests are legitimate. They like the strategy, they incorporate trading costs. And so there is a spectrum there. 
It's like flying a plane. Do you want instruments? Do you want data? Yes, you do. Do you also want windows? Sure. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be great. So what are you doing going forward? So we are migrating slowly toward this new strategy of being able to take more risk. And that's how you know, what the board has said. The board has said, yeah, we're getting more comfortable with the idea of taking more risk because we've got to find more return. And we also believe that you can't find return without risk. And so we're following a strategy of maintaining a lower than peer risk profile, but potentially becoming increasing illiquids, comfortable with leverage and we would also concentrate if we could. Most of the managers that we are invested with aren't taking more capital. So it's hard to concentrate if you can't rebalance. So on the margin, what you laid out was an unusually benign environment for the last five years. And a degree of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen going forward. And now you're saying, oh, but we want to take a little bit more risk. How does that come together? Because everything you said up to that point, I would have said, well, maybe the portfolio you had in the past is the right one for going forward. Yeah. Well, I would agree. But if you look at what we are projecting forward, it's right around 8%. We have an expected return of 8% on a volatility of around 5 That's how we model our overall portfolio. We've achieved 8% on less than 2% volatility. So we're not conditioning the future on the past. What we're saying is, well, let's take a 5% risk budget, which is about half of what we think peers have, and let's move that to six or seven. We're not saying let's become like an endowment, although we would consider that if the, if the board was willing to accept the type of potential adverse outcome, certainly. And people take a look at our portfolio and say, well, you're just all focused on alpha and you hate beta. And no, we don't hate beta. We treat beta as we do every other risk in the portfolio as something. And we have an expectation for that risk. And we have a conviction in that risk. So if at some point equity beta becomes highly, highly attractive as it was in March of 09, not without risk, but I'd like to think that we would have a lot more of equity beta in the portfolio at that point. It just doesn't make sense based on what we are expecting going forward. And hey, we're moving assets into strategies that do have embedded equity beta. Why would you do that at this point? Well, we believe that sometimes those strategies have a lot more potential alpha. What are examples of some of those? Well, strategies? if you look at the best private equity managers, even including you know the fees, they've had fantastic returns. Same thing with hedge funds, right? The dispersion on these private investment vehicles, hedge funds, private equity, private real estate, private energy, the dispersion is massive because the rewards are huge. People will flood in and if you can earn fees without performance, great. So let's talk a little bit about the manager selection process, which is going to be key if you really need to get the ones at the right end of the dispersion. Where does your process start? The world is a big place. And so we try to be smart about how the pipeline is put together. And so we've got 15 different places that we're sourcing from. We look to our board. We have a lot of practitioners on the board. We've got people who are deep in private equity. We've got people who are deep in hedge funds. We've got people who are deep in risk management. And so that's a tool for us. What are the other 14? Oh, well, <laughs> peers, other family offices, as well as other endowments and foundations. I think the idea for the Institute is one of our other competitive advantages. We're smaller. We're about a billion dollars. We're, we can afford to be in smaller, more esoteric, more unknown things that larger endowments and foundations might not be interested in. We hear <laughs> there's direct reach outs, there's third party marketers, there are cap intro groups. I welcome all of the inputs. What does that first meeting look like for you and your team? We don't have a lot of time. So let's just get down to it. Why are you different? How do you take risk and how do you manage risk? Institutional quality risk management. And it's a foreign language to a lot of managers. When I joined Ford, I remember one of the first meetings I had with a manager. I had brought in my brand new risk dashboard and we've taken your returns. We have put them through our risk calculations and we've looked at fit with our portfolio and this and that. And 
it looks to us like you have a little bit of a value tilt in your portfolio. Can you explain it? This particular manager took it and they put it inside a folder and they closed the folder on top of it. And they said, we don't think about the portfolio like that. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I think I was, educate me. How do you think about the portfolio? I welcome diversity of thought, welcome diversity of portfolio management. Where have you made mistakes on the manager basis? Well, I think operationally, focusing on smaller managers entails risks that you you have to be aware of. And we've had the misfortune of investing with groups that we thought had fantastic ideas and IP and failed operationally. And so we're pushed out either from having not the right investor base or not the ability to actually sustain a business long term. So is there a size that is your sweet spot for managers? No. We have managers ranging from $400 million hedge fund to the tens of billions of dollars. And we've seen all the research as well, smaller managers. This, and it's I don't disagree with any of that research, but by and large, we think that you can make money in lots of different ways. And if you're large and you're playing in an illiquid area or you're large and you're not able to pursue high quality deals, then sure, you're not going to make a lot of money. But if you're large and you're playing in a very liquid area and you have an edge or you're large and you're the only game in town who can take a deal down, then you're going to make some money, right? So it's all about edge. And yes, I see in general, by and large, smaller managers are making more money than larger managers. How do you approach the scarcity issue in private equity of needing to be with the best performing private equity firms? Yeah. That is very, very difficult, right? And that's hard because it appears that skill is persistent. Going back, putting my management consulting hat on, Hamilton always talked about power in business. He's written a book called Seven Powers, which I recommend on business strategy. And what you've ended up with, these private equity firms and the ones with persistent good performance and venture as well, they're incredibly powerful businesses, their franchises. They have access to deals. They have all sorts of levers of power. They control their suppliers and they control their customers, right? Customers are begging to get in to pay incredibly high fees to these managers because they want a piece of that alpha pie. They want a piece of that sustainable power in that business. And it's amazing what a powerful VC firm, the terms that they can negotiate with a portfolio company who wants that brand. So there's brand power there. There's relationship and cornered resources. Definitely great sustainability there. But you see emerging firms come in and challenge incumbents. And so there is a little bit of that as well. There's some mobility if you are looking to enter in and you can't get access to one of the great managers, if you've got to look for who the up and comers are. And look for the keys that will give them some ability to succeed, even if they don't have access to those first tier deals. Is there something there that is going to give them an edge and potentially vault them into that sustainable area? And what's your success been at picking those? I haven't analyzed it. I think we're pretty content with our manager group. We would give more capital to all of the managers in our portfolio if we could. When you look at the portfolio from a risk lens and knowingly think differently about it than many of your peers, what metrics do you think your peers might be missing in their assessment of risk? It is very, very complicated. And you know, I think that's what one thing that we recognize and are comfortable with is that complexity. And I remember being at a conference and describing our portfolio to a group of trustees. It was a Cambridge trustee conference. And I got done describing our portfolio and a guy raised his hand in the back and said, yeah, that sounds really complex. You know, I prefer simple. <laughs> I said, yeah, I prefer simple too. I just can't get what we need to get done with simple. And so what I think that we do that others don't is we look at risk from a variety of 
different dimensions, both qualitative and quantitative. And so we're looking at coincident drawdowns in the portfolio. We're looking at stress tightening in, from beta. That's a Marty Leibowitz contribution. We're defining risk in a whole variety of different ways, not just volatility, not just quote unquote permanent loss of capital. And we were looking at outcomes. One of the things that we do that is I think unusual, but maybe shouldn't be unusual, is we have forward-looking expectations for every single one of our managers. And sometimes it's informed by the manager. Sometimes we have to invent it because we do have managers in the portfolio that say, nah, here's what we're targeting, equity-like returns with half the vol. You know, that's a long, short manager. But what are you targeting? What do you expect? We don't put a number on that. Well, what's the range? Well, we don't specify range. Okay. I think if you're going to manage a portfolio, you have to have those ideas in your own mind to correctly size and manage the risk in the portfolio. Can you talk about some of the actions that you've taken as a result of one of two things, either some of these risk metrics that are a little bit different or a difference in the expectations. So if you say the last five years, most of your hedge fund managers probably didn't meet those return expectations. So that's where it gets complicated. And uh, that's where you have to say, well, this is what we were expecting. This is what occurred. Would this person have been in this risk zone if what we actually had expected to occur had occurred? right? So again, focus on process, not outcome. The outcome has been very, very, very unusual in the last five years. Don't think that that's representative of anyone's outcome. Understand why it happened and what drove that and use it as a clue to what might happen. That's what we're doing. And sometimes, look, in this portfolio, there are a lot of things that we classify as un- known risks or idiosyncratic risk. We can extract equity beta. We can extract volatility as a risk factor. We can extract rates and rate movements. We can extract oil. We can extract alternative betas as well. There's a lot of unknown risk. And so coming up with ways of addressing those, you know, that noise is part of the art of this portfolio and and our job. Go back to 2004 and my time at Quantal with the university finance folks and very quantitative process. There's a book uh, by Grinold and Kahn, Active Portfolio Management, that talks about how risk and return in active space are calibrated. And that's one of our first principles. Do we believe that these managers are skillful enough to convert if they get the opportunity to convert active risk into return? And the answer is yes. And so why haven't hedge funds done it then? Why? Well, if you look at the environment and you look at the constraints that are put on portfolios and you look at people who manage risk, right? That's the key here. Risk takers have been rewarded in the last five years. The folks who've had the pedal to the floor, have crushed it. And so, sure, if you wanted to take risk in the last five years, great. Do you want to keep taking risk, right? Do you think you're going to get rewarded for that? So the people who actually have not done as well, in my view, in the last five years, have been some of the best investors and definitely some of the best risk managers in the world, period. And you're going to see over a cycle, last five years, in a cycle. We're going to see a cycle at some point. All right. I want to turn to some closing questions, but before we do, I didn't get a chance to ask you about what the Institute does. So the Institute is an amazing place. It's where Einstein was. Einstein was the cornerstone faculty there. The place was built around him and it's four schools. It's physics, math, humanities, social science, and history. And so it's this beautiful blend, actually, of quantitative and qualitative. And by design, the Institute's symbol is truth and beauty combined. The portfolio and the way that we think is highly, highly aligned with the way that the Institute is pursuing knowledge. And so what does it do? It pursues knowledge. 
the director of the Institute, Robert Digraf, just resurrected a book by Alexander Flexner, who was one of the founders with the Bamberger family in the 1930s of the Institute, called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. And it's the pursuit of quote unquote useless knowledge. We have GPS on our mobile phones these days and we take that for granted. But uh, Robert points out in the book that if Einstein hadn't figured out you know, the theory of general relativity, we wouldn't have GPS. We have to correct for relative motion of satellites when we're coming up with a position location. So that type of thing. I asked one of our other board members, why are you involved? And he said, well, we're building cathedrals. I said, what is that? He said, we're working on stuff that is not going to be done in our lifetime, but is important. So it's a really terrific place. I encourage anyone to go check it out and come visit. It's uh, 800 acres in Princeton, just south of the Princeton campus. It's all open to the public. I see people walking their dogs and riding bikes and walking around. It's a really, really beautiful, serene place to think. All right, let's turn to some closing questions. Sure. What's your favorite talent or hobby, either now or from when you were younger? I am a jack of all trades, master at none. I enjoy golfing. I enjoy tennis. I enjoy ice skating. I enjoy reading. Movie. There's no one extracurricular activity that I focused on that I have decided to become world class at. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? It has to be overconfidence in hubris. So I think it's the role of luck in investing is not well recognized or appreciated. Folks like Michael Mabison have written about it. And when people mix up skill and luck, it annoys me. And so I've met a lot of managers over the past 10 years and have met some great, incredibly skillful managers, have met some who I am just shocked that they've been as successful as they have. And there's this focus on outcome versus process. And it's very easy to believe that you knew something was going to happen and come up with a story and a narrative as to why that happened. And when I see that in a manager, that bothers me a great deal. I want to see an acknowledgement of risk. In order to manage risk, you have to know you're taking it. So I am not a believer in sure things in this industry. What's the quote from, well, it's attributed to Mark Twain, but it's not what you know, it's what you don't know that gets you in trouble. And it's actually Josh Billings that that quote should be attributed to. I think it's ironic that everyone thinks it's Mark Twain. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Yeah, I'm lucky because my parents are both educators. My dad was a professor. My mom was a school teacher and a principal. And so they've always stressed the importance of education and continued learning. I never believed them when I was younger. My dad would say, yeah, I'm still learning. How can you be learning? You're so old. Now I'm old and I'm still learning. <laughs> and that's the only thing you can do, I think. You have to keep expanding your world. The world is a big place. What information do you read and get a lot out of that other people might not know about? In this world, I think the information sources are, are all known. I would say my answer again is in line with everything else. Read broadly. I don't know if there's anything I, I don't read. You say astrological charts and, <laughs> and fortune cookies. I actually read fortune cookies, so they're fun. What's your favorite go-to investment newsletter? has to be Bridgewater Daily Observations. You know, that's been something that I've read for 10 years plus. I like the way they think, like what they've built. Do you want to talk about a manager focused on process? Yeah, fortunate that they share those ideas. Howard Marks, absolutely. Michael Mabison loved everything that he has written, written at Credit Suisse and beyond. His books, Richard Bookstaber, Pretty interesting. That's probably a little bit off the beaten path there. I would recommend his book, The End of Theory. That will be mind expanding in terms, you want to talk about risk management that others are not thinking of. So the application of agent-based modeling and agent-based processes, really, really interesting. We're just getting to the point where computers are powerful enough to simulate things with, with agents by just modeling very discrete behaviors, right? And if you go back to what Soros talked about in reflexivity and, and then you think of 
how we manage risk and how surprised we are when things are nonlinear or outside of expectations. That's one way of addressing it with agent-based simulations. You find that when you incorporate behavior and psychology into markets, the best description is not something that's volatile, but it's something that's turbulent. And turbulence is different than volatility because it's a nonlinear dynamical system, right? You see phase transitions and laminar to turbulent transitions. You know, these are the types of things that are occurring. All right, Mark, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Yeah, I think the role of luck is probably a lesson to be learned. And you really don't have the type of control that you think you have or want to have over your environment. You are in an uncertain environment and that things may not occur just exactly how you plan or want them to occur, but that you need to be resilient and you need to be flexible in the way that you're thinking. You need to be able to pivot. I may not have been in a different place at this point in life, but I probably would have had a little more satisfaction along the way, <laughs> less disappointment. Mark, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Before you take off, I've created three different ways for you to stay updated on the podcast and my blog according to your preferences. First, you can sign up to receive a monthly email with a few great things I've read and listened to over the month. Second, for more prompt delivery, you can subscribe to my blog and receive emails when each podcast episode and blog post come out. And last, you can access the full library of transcripts by signing up for a premium subscription. All three options are available on the homepage at capitalallocatorspodcast.com. Thanks for your support. 